<laughs> so I've asked you to uh, work with your group to talk about the differences and then the similarity uh, between internal and external energy. I'm going to start off with the similarities. Pretty basic there, right? Did anybody come up with any other similarities other than uh, they both have heat and energy? Anybody? Anybody have any other difference or similarities? Yeah, energy. Yeah. I'm not, I don't have anything else. Heat and energy, those are good similarities. Pretty basic, but um, external energy. I totally agree with what you guys put on the board. External energy comes from the sun. Not <laughs> just in case you couldn't see. Plus, I am recording this lesson, so they can't see the board. Um. So then, how long the sun is around? Ooh. Okay. So you're and okay. So this one was the same. So I think what we're starting here is the different cause. Uh. So different things that affect how much energy we receive from the sun. So how long the sun is around, as long as you guys get that. But does anybody remember the official term for that? Hello? <laughs> Nothing? What is the actual phrase for how long the sun is around? Duration of daylight. If you have it, or insulation. If you do not have that word, please add it. I have insulation. Duration. Of duration of insulation. Duration just means how long it's around, just like, or how long it's out. So I only had one of the three causes up, or the three things that affect the amount of energy we receive. What's another one then? Yeah, depth. Yep, the angle of insulation, which again, just means how high it is in the sky. And there was one more that controls how much ener energy we receive from the sun. Yeah, how see-through the atmosphere is. External energy, that definition that's up there is perfect. Energy that, well, you didn't say the energy part, but yes, internal energy is energy that comes from inside Earth. Yeah, I also put that one. You, you did. You did a good job. Oh, no, I put that one. Crazy. You said I was slacking, but yeah. Well, but I did only get that. There's a little bit more differences for internal energy. I got that one. What, what do you want to add, Carter? Oh, I got that one. No, I'm going to have you add another one. Leftover heat. Oh, that wasn't Carter, but okay. Leftover heat. Where's that heat left over from, though? Yeah. Uh, nah. That's just a classroom with the first period. It was not warm today, I don't think. Dang it. Cassie, do you think it was warm today? Oh, no, that was actually warm. Um, and what about the other one? Yep, radioactive decay. Yeah. Perfect. I like it. Anything else? No. Okay. Um, I want to add one thing that we did not put in this, nor did I ask you to put this, put it in there. But I want in this blank space underneath the chart, I want to add a little bit of notes. Ready for it? Can you guys see from where you are? 
The little bit of note. He, okay, that's great. Good to know. Do you guys know from the reading or off the top of your head how the sun produces energy in the first place? Yeah. Go back to the reading if you don't remember if you don't remember what it said. Great. No. How does the sun produce energy? It does. So that's my question. The sun produces energy through doing what? How does the en sun make energy? Nuclear fusion. So I want you to add at the bottom of your paper. Sun produces energy through nuclear fusion. You want to put a dot dot dot? You can, if, if you want. I put the dot 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 because I was like giving you that time to think, but so this is a random fact that you do need to kind of memorize for this chapter and for the region. So the sun, and, and the concept is actually a little bit more than what you need to know for earth science. But just to give you a little bit of background, the sun is made out of mostly hydrogen atoms. And what the sun does is something we actually cannot do here on earth yet. It takes two of those hydrogen atoms and fuses their nuclei together. When you do that, you create a huge amount of energy. It also takes a lot of energy to do that, more energy than we can provide it here on Earth. And those two atoms fuse together to make a new helium atom. That's how the sun and all stars, for that matter, create their energy. Nuclear fusion. Um, actually, now that I think of it, you don't need this until a couple chapters later, but I did want to add it here. Um, so that, that's good enough for now. Let's go over your homework. Right away, I know this first question probably gave a lot of you trouble. Who agrees that you had a lot of trouble with this first one? No, probably not. No? Okay, so let me just, can you guys at least show me on your fingers what you picked so that I can see how much you are lying to me? No? Okay, okay. What'd you guys pick over there? Huh? Don't look at Felicia's answer. I don't know. Okay, which answer did you pick? Okay, Carter. I don't know what you got there. Okay. All right. What'd you guys get over there? Okay. All right. You guys did pretty good. The answer is two stratosphere. Um, I am going to walk through it just in case anybody did struggle. The reason I personally think people struggle with this one is that graph. That graph is kind of ugly, and we've never seen anything like it before. We've never talked about ozone before. So actually, I'm going to take a step back. Have you guys heard of ozone before? Ozone layer. And you always follow it up with ozone layer. And where is the ozone layer? Okay, somewhere in the sky, somewhere in the atmosphere. Then how come when we learned the layers of the atmosphere, is there not an ozone layer? And that, let me just give you a little background. The ozone layer is not a designated layer like these guys, not like the troposphere, the stratosphere, and the mesosphere. And it actually does move around a little bit. What the ozone layer is, is an area in the atmosphere where the, uh, where the molecule ozone, which is O3, like oxygen, but three of them, bonded together. And those three oxygens making ozone actually protect us here on Earth from some of the UV rays that the sun shoots down on us. We're going to learn a little bit more about UV rays, but does anybody know what those rays do? Okay, UV rays are the ones that give us sunburn, sun tan, 
and eventually could damage our skin and give us skin cancer. So the ozone layer is good because it reduces the amount of those rays that can get through the Earth's atmosphere. So that instead of like burning as much, um, okay, what a, you, you, you too, that's that right. You can stay there, Zach, you're distracted, move. I'm not distracted. So this ozone is a good thing. It knows how much UV, or it reduces the amount of rays that can get to us. Uh, O3 though, which I wrote up here, O3, we can't breathe it. If we were only in a room that had just O3, we'd end up suffocating because we only breathe O2. So ozone pollution on the surface of the earth is actually bad for us, but we do need ozone in the atmosphere. Uh, if you've ever heard of the hole in the ozone layer, uh, that's because uh, some molecule, some other molecules will go through a chemical reaction with the O3 and steal one of those O's to make it back to O2. Again, that'd be cool here on Earth, but up in the atmosphere, we need those O3s to block the UV. So when you put these chemicals that break up the O3 into the atmosphere, it's a bad thing because then it reduces the amount of O3 in the atmosphere, making more UV rays able to come to us. By the way, that was all stuff that you technically don't need to know for the region, but I feel it's good information to tell you as humans living on Earth. Okay, so if that seems a little above and you're like, I didn't write anything down, no worries. You don't have to know that for any test I'm gonna give you. Just thought it was a good idea to tell you. Back to this though, actually technically back to this. So they're telling us that during different months of the year in Arizona, the ozone is in different spots. This is just a graph. Three, four, what, one, four separate lines on the graph. What's on the x-axis of the graph that's provided here? Oh, oh guys, it's so you're not sitting in your seat, I still want you. Paying attention and learning and answering questions. Yeah, the, on the x-axis is the ozone concentration. So the farther to the left the line is, the less ozone there is. And the farther to the right, the more ozone there is. So each month, the amount of ozone changes. But here's a maximum there, 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 and there. So I just took the dots that were furthest to the right on each one of those lines. Then we can use the y-axis. Again, it doesn't matter which side. This side's just for kilometers. This side's for miles. And figure out how high up in the sky those maximums were. This one's a little above five. This one and this one are between five, uh, 10 and 15. And this one's a little bit, maybe around 17 miles. I decided to go to the mile side, but you could have done the same thing on the kilometer side. So now we know how high they are. How do we figure out what layer that is? Okay, bring in our reference table here. So remember I said they were between about seven and 17 miles. Any one of those answers are just like you guys said, the stratosphere. Yes, it did just take me about eight minutes to go over the question you already all knew the answer to, but great job. It's just a, a yeah, but I told a little story in between. The greatest amount of pressure. Where is the greatest pressure? What layer, guys? The troposphere, right there. That's the, sorry, right there is the highest pressure we'll ever get. So remember, pressure's on the x-axis this time. So pressure would, the biggest pressure, the one farthest to the right is one, and that's in the troposphere. The, oh, I skipped two. I'm sorry. So. That was three. Skip two. An air temperature of 95 most often exists in 95 degrees Celsius. Thermosphere. So 95 is not listed on here, but if this is a, a zero and this is 100, 95 is pretty close to 100. Go up till you hit the line. The only place the temperature gets near uh, 95 is in the thermosphere. 
that's answer four. What happens as the elevation above sea level, as the elevation above sea level in Earth's atmosphere increases, the measured pressure will. So as elevation goes up, here's elevation. What happens to pressure? Decreases, it goes from one at the ground to zero up in the sky. So it does decrease. Which part of the atmosphere has the smallest distance from the bottom to the top? Which one's the smallest? Caitlin, did you answer that? Which one's the smallest layer? We're on question five. <clears throat> Which one'd you pick? We picked one. You picked a good one. Troposphere, smallest distance. It's literally the skinniest layer. You could have done math. No need to do math. This is a nice, that's why it's nice that they did nice even scales. You can just see that the troposphere is the skinniest. Number five, the answer is one. Nearly all the water vapor in the atmosphere is found. Destiny, did you tell me which one the water vapor is in? That's the good wrong answer. It is the, and people get tricked by this all the time. So the water vapor, so first of all, is there any water up here in the thermosphere? Any in the mesosphere? Nope, so I'm gonna cross those off. So then we're only left with the stratosphere and the troposphere. When we look at the line in the stratosphere, if we read that down to the water vapor, it's somewhere between zero and 10. But when we're over here in the troposphere, it goes from about 10 up to 40. So most of the water vapor is found in the troposphere. A lot of people think because that's the top of the graph that that's the most, but remember concentrations on the X axis. So thank you, Destiny, for making that mistake so I could explain it. And then I'm curious, everybody right now, flash me your answer for number seven. Everybody, don't look at someone else. Flash me your answer. I see two different answers, and they are the most common I ever see. No one answered three, that the atmosphere's altitude is less than the depth of the ocean. Because, guys, remember, it goes to 600 kilometers. That's pretty high, so that's not it. And no one answered the atmosphere is more dense than the lithosphere. By the way, what the heck is the lithosphere? Ooh, what's, what's the lithosphere made out of? Oh, do we not remember this word? No, it's in your reference. Oh, okay. Um, Carter says it's in our reference table. Carter, where will we find the word lithosphere in our reference table? Oh, yeah? So everybody go find the lithosphere in your reference table, please. Flip through. Carter says it's there. Carter's not wrong. The lithosphere is in your reference table. I don't know where that. Do you have Jeff, do you know what the lithosphere is? Word. Jeff, do you know what the lithosphere is made out of? Crust. So I'll show you uh, where it is in the reference table. Page 10. Everybody flip there. Well, we're getting off topic, but not really. Page 10 of your reference table, right there. The lithosphere is made out of the crust and the rigid mantle. Guys, what's another, when we talked about the crust and the rigid mantle way back when, what are they made out of? The lithosphere, which is the crust and rigid mantle, is made out of what? Don't think earth science. Think um, an answer you tell a five-year-old. Hmm? I'm still sitting here, yes. Rocks, yeah. Lithosphere is made out of rocks. Atmosphere is made out of what? An answer you tell a five-year-old. Gas is air, yeah. Which one's more dense, air or rocks? Rocks, definitely. That's why answer four is wrong. The atmosphere is more dense than the lithosphere. So then we got to decide, 
Is the atmosphere layered with each layer possessing distinct characteristics or is the atmosphere a shell of gases that surrounds most of Earth? Anybody want to reconsider their answer? Flash me your final answers. Is it one or two, guys? Carter, what do you think? You got to think. Which one of those? And by the way, the answer, the question says, which statement most accurately describes Earth's atmosphere? <clears throat> Jeff, I like your answer, number one. Those of you who picked number two, can you reread that? Or anyone who picked, who, how about all of you? Reread answer number two and tell me what's not the most accurate with it. Oh, yeah. sorry, your facial expressions gave it away. Kat, what did you just read? Uh-huh, and why is that wrong? No, it actually does. This is a word right here that I don't like. Most of the earth. Is there anywhere you can go on Earth and there's no atmosphere? No, no, no. There is atmosphere everywhere. There is no place that is not able to breathe because there's no atmosphere. It is a shell of gases, though, that surrounds all of Earth. Even if the answer said all of the Earth, answer one is most accurate. It gives the most details about the atmosphere. It is layered. It does have distinct characteristics in each layer. They all have their own temperature and their own pressure. This is a case of them really messing with you. That covering the most of Earth, they put that there because they didn't think you'd read that word. So it is a shell of gases, but it surrounds all of Earth and it is layered based on characteristics. Here's another one of those ozone questions. So like I said, it's technically not something I am required to teach you, but they do often talk about the ozone in questions like this, where they tell you a little bit about it and then expect you to use your skills. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so it says that ozone is concentrated 20 to 35 kilometers. Now this time they specifically only gave you kilometers. There's page 14, I lost it. 20 to 35 kilometers puts you in the stratosphere. Um, notice, um, if you had used miles, you would have thought it was a stratosphere and mesosphere. So read the words carefully. What's the approximate temperature of the mesosphere at an altitude of 68 kilometers? What'd you guys say for this one? Because I struggled a little, not going to lie. Two? What else? Anybody else have an answer? Please, you all answer. You all did your homework. Put your fingers up. Two, two. Anybody else? Is that two or three? Two? Okay. The reason I struggled with this because 68 isn't on here. Where is 68? Kilometers. Nobody's gonna answer me? Well, this is 50, 60, 70. Somewhere close to 70. Go over till you hit the line. Go down. As long as your line is fairly straight, you get really close to negative 55. Not gonna lie, here was mine from last period, and I made a curvy line for some reason and got a really wrong answer. So always make sure, and that was with me drawing a line and my line was still curvy. A lot of times people just use their finger and go over and down. Make sure your finger makes a straight line then. So I got close to negative 55, which is an answer. I also screwed up question 10 because I didn't read it carefully. Question 10 says, what is the approximate altitude 
of the mesopause in the atmosphere. Did they ask for, what did they ask for? Altitude, is that on the X or the Y axis? Y, that's where I screwed up. Here's the mesopause. Altitude is this way. So either 50 miles or 80 kilometers. Notice, remember how yesterday I told you, but there is an 82 kilometers. That's the right answer. But notice how they put 50 as the first answer. But remember, it was 50 miles, not kilometers. And they put that one first on purpose. They thought about that. They're like, kids are going to say 50. I'm going to mess with them and put it first even though that was 50 kilometers, not 50 miles. The stratosphere, the temperature ranges from, stratosphere is right here. The coldest, the strata, or the warmest, no, I say it again, coldest is negative 55, and it warms up to zero. Negative 55, oh, they did it again, and I almost fell for it. Which answer is it? Oh, did any of you also fall for it? Number 11 is three. Four. Who put one? Because I think I circled one last period. Second. Second period, sorry. What's wrong with answer one? It's uh, Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Then Fahrenheit. We need Celsius. I like question 12 because they gave us a picture and told us the satellites, the satellites that they shoot up in the air are 75 kilometers above Earth's surface. 75 kilometers, not miles, kilometers puts you in the mesosphere. Answer three. Question 13 through the end was all about the reference table on the front page. And I need to reiterate the importance of you guys knowing what the word abundant means. Most of it. Abundant means most. So which one's the most? Which one is there the most of in the troposphere? Here's the troposphere. We either have 21, 78, or one, clearly 78, is most, and that's nitrogen. So number 13 is nit three nitrogen, but number 14 asks you the same question about the hydrosphere. So either 33 or 66 or what? So that's 66 and that's hydrogen. Then they try, it is a very similar question, but then they throw it into a pie graph. Hopefully you guys are able to recognize that that was supposed to be A and B. I don't think I told your class. That's A and B. If you didn't know that and you got it wrong, did anybody not know that? Do it now. Which, if that was A and B, which one, which letters? Oh my gosh, why am I having such trouble? If this said A and B, so notice A and B take up more than half of this pie graph. Answer four. Answer four, because, and this was by math in the crust. So the two that are the way bigger than everything else are oxygen and silicon, 46 and 28%. That gives you well over 50%. Answer four. And then finally, the Earth's troposphere, hydrosphere, and lithosphere contain large amounts of which one of these guys? In fact, it's the only one that's in all three layers. Oxygen. Oxygen. All right. Well, that was not an overly difficult day. Um, you have no homework. I know you're welcome, but a lot of you need to do test corrections. So get those test corrections done. Oh, yeah, tomorrow. Uh, yeah, probably.